Hey, all Scott here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make this show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first and just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way, the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, Scott Horton Show. And guess what? I got Sheldon Richmond on the line. Hey, Sheldon, how the hell are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm doing great. Appreciate you joining us again on the show. My pleasure. All right. So, as always. Uh, you wrote some things, as per usual. And yeah. uh, I want to talk about the one before last. First, if that's all right, how Americans can help Ukrainians. I know you're one of these lousy peaceniks who thinks that the uh, you know U.S. federal Uncle Sam should not go and make everything perfect in the world, whatever your problem is. But so, what can Americans do if not wage war against Russia in order to guarantee the sovereign sanctity of the borders of the Crimean Peninsula? Uh, three words. Open the borders. And I don't mean the bookstore. That's out of business. Let, <laughs> yeah, let, any, any, let any Ukrainian who wants to get out of there uh, come here. Now, I'm not saying they'll all move, but it's an unpleasant neighborhood to live in. I wouldn't want to live in the shadow of Russia, and I think we should make it possible for any individual who wants to leave, either temporarily or uh, intending it to be permanent, to do so. It's inhumane for us to uh, basically lock people in unpleasant and miserable uh, circumstances. Yeah, it's like Bob Higgs says, don't just stand there, undo something. So we yeah. don't have to ask our government to do anything, just stop excluding Ukrainians from immigrating here if they want. Uh, I agree. That's, that's, a, that's a position. I think it's an important thing that should be done. I don't think just for Ukrainians, as I say in the article, but, uh, but, but uh, instead of talking about loan guarantees or possible military confrontation, uh, which would be uh, hurt lots of innocent people, uh, that's one thing that we're at least, that's a micro solution, a micro approach. Let individuals decide if they want to get out of there and what better place to come than here. Yeah. By the way, what else do you think about this Ukrainian crisis? Well, it's not a threat to the United States, the American people. Russia, uh, you know, is a big regional power and it always will be. I mean, anybody who knows anything about Russian history knows, can understand what's going on there. It uh, doesn't mean I'm a fan of Putin. I'm not. I wouldn't want to live under Putin. Uh, I, I don't approve of his mobilizing his uh, military and, and sending, uh, getting troops ready or putting them in Crimea because I don't like militaries. I don't like governments, but I don't like when governments resort to the militaries to solve problems. On the other hand, I think we can understand the context. This is not a mo- first move for world conquest. It's not, uh, uh, you know, it's not, it's not Czechoslovakia and Hitler. Uh, and it, he, he uh, the West, uh, the West, and particularly the U.S. has done a heck of a lot to to put uh, him and the other Russian leaders on edge by moving NATO up to the, uh, you know, to the boundary uh, up to their borders. Uh, this is stuff you you've already discussed on your show with other people, but it's quite true. Uh, a, you know, a promise was broken to Gorbachev by Jim Baker on behalf of on behalf of George H. W. Bush that. That if they, uh, that if the Russians were, were going to leave uh, Eastern Germany and let uh, Germany reunite and and uh, perhaps even join NATO, uh, if the Russians would allow that to happen, uh, then NATO would not move any further east, and that promise was quickly broken. And just about all the former Soviet allies are in NATO now, and they talk about adding uh, Ukraine and uh, and Georgia, and, uh, and and they're virtual members of of uh, NATO already because NATO has this thing called Partnership for Peace, and and those two countries are in it. Uh, that's like a halfway house to NATO, as far as I can see. And so uh, they've done everything to make the, the Russians nervous, and then they wonder why the Russians act like they're nervous. Mm. No big mystery. You know, I wonder if maybe the problem is that the smartest foreign policy guy we got in D.C. is a big new Brzezinski, and he's a madman. He's one of these guys <laughs> who's, uh, you know, compared to the neoconservatives, he's good on Iraq and Iran or something like that, or on Palestine, too. But uh, when it comes to his pathological hatred of Russia, uh, he's no better than Dick Cheney. I, I'm sure you saw where in Robert Gates' new memoir, uh, I haven't read it, but it's reported that in that memoir, he recounts how Dick Cheney, back at the fall of the Soviet Union, wanted to go ahead and 
I don't know what he thought his plan was, but he wanted to go ahead and push for the complete dissolution of the nation state of Russia, break it into as many pieces as they possibly could. Well, you know, I'm a little disoriented because uh, two guys who have actually uh, written op-eds that were fairly sensible, certainly relatively speaking, were Brzezinski and Henry Kissinger. So my head's spinning. Well, you know, there were... I think (laughs) you must be referring to what Brzezinski wrote in the Financial Times because the thing that he wrote in the Washington Post, I think it was, was absolutely and completely out of control, saying we have to send uh, military equipment to the Ukrainians, we have to double down, we have to make absolute threats about red lines that must not be crossed when it comes to any Uh, further encroachment. And he changed his mind because in the Financial Times he was talking about how how the it's possible that Ukraine and Russia could could, uh, reach an agreement like Finland did with Russia. Uh, which isn't a bad agreement. A bad, you know, that's not a bad agreement. I mean, Finland has freedom of action. All they did was promise not to be a staging ground for a, a military invasion or, you know, uh, a launching of an attack against Russia. Mm-hmm. And they've been pretty much left alone. So yeah, um, I saw where Kissinger was regret. pretty reasonable. I, I was amazed, and I had to double-check my own premises. Wait, I agree with Kissinger. He agrees with me. Maybe yeah. something's wrong here, but now it seemed pretty good. But And, well, and I, 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 maybe I see the... reference to the Finland piece by Brzezinski in the Financial Times, but the only one I read by him, he was, uh, maybe he w- he wrote this right as the Russians were moving into Crimea um, further. They already have bases there, of course, but uh, uh, he was just, you know, blood dripping from his fangs. He is mad well, at he must have ta- he must have he must have been talking to his son, Ian, because I see Ian Brzezinski, that's Mika's brother, on uh, Morning Joe, and he's a real hawk. So, uh, Unfortunately, maybe Ian got to Mr. Zbig. That's too bad. Well, and, you know, this goes back to his whole thing. We're going to be running a piece about this on Antiwar.com this weekend, too, in fact, mm-hmm. um, is about the Grand Chessboard, and, and, which is his book, his strategy for the uh, expansion of the American Empire through Central Asia after the end of the Cold War. Uh, where he mm-hmm. talks about just how important Ukraine is. Uh, he considers, and maybe he's quoting Russians to this effect, that uh, Ukraine is their bridge to Europe and therefore is really the key piece of whether they can be a global power or not, whether they can be an empire or not. If they don't have Ukraine and Crimea and that warm water port there, then that's everything to them, which is why it should be everything to us to make sure to keep it out of their hands. Well, you know, you know, he just... sounds like Bill Crystal, frankly, completely out of his mind. These people have learned nothing uh, from history, because if they really want to put an end to, you know, Russian activity, and therefore, so we never have to worry about it again, they're going to have to nuke them. I mean, what the hell are they talking about? Russia is Russia. It's not going to change anytime soon. And so do we want perpetual war or a final showdown? Or do we want to learn to live with it? I mean, come on, grow up, people. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, that's my thing, too, is wait, but H-bombs, right? So that's it. That's the end of the argument. You can only push them so far. What else is there to do? And in fact, yeah. I mean, even if they, uh, you know, okay, so what if they expand NATO? I, I actually learned from that Peter Beinart piece in in the New Republic just how much uh, cooperation they already have between NATO and all of the stands, Turkmenistan and Tajikistan and yeah. Kazakhstan and yeah. Kyrgyzstan, that all of them have kind of NATO partnerships and are working hard right. on right. standardizing their military to to uh, fit That's into true. NATO doctrine and all that kind of thing. There's a point where we might do that so much where, you know, what if somebody to the right of Putin seizes power and decides right. that, you know, he needs a preemptive strike now before they're never going to be able to get off a shot. And, uh, right. you know what I mean? They could really push this thing too far just... It almost seems to me like they're sleepwalking. I mean, you have the obsessions of the Brzezinski's, but you also just have the special interest type rent seeking of Lockheed and all their push to expand NATO that they've waged this whole time. And it seems like mostly it's a thoughtless policy, right? It's like Victoria Newland's running the whole game and they don't even realize what kind of trouble they're risking getting us all into here. Well, that seems hard to believe. I mean, this is, there's no subtlety about any of this. And I have, to, you know, I, I'm not the conspiratorial type, and maybe this doesn't mean this wouldn't uh, uh, require a conspiracy. But I, it's hard to believe they don't, they didn't know they would get this kind of response. Uh, I think people still start need to also pay attention to Stephen Cohen at yeah. NYU in Princeton, who's who's a, a Soviet, you know, tologist. He's been one for many, many years, and he's written some very uh, interesting things about this. And uh, it's hard to believe they didn't know 
that they were going to get this, and maybe there's something in it for them. Uh, you know, the military is talking about cutting back in the U.S., so this would be a good way to stop that. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just hard to believe they they don't know that, that they don't have Russian specialists who would say, wait a second, this is not a good idea, and who would hold sway. So I, I don't know that they're stupid. I mean, a lot of times the only conclusion is that they're stupid. If you look at what they did in, in Iraq, I can't explain that, but but except by sheer stupidity. Yeah. But this, this, uh, this, I think you can explain uh, in another way. And yeah. I have a feeling maybe they wanted, they wanted the fruits of this crisis. You make an interesting That's point there. You know, uh, Ted Snyder talked about how, uh, you know, it looked to him like they really wanted Yanukovych to have to say no. They offered him a deal that he could not possibly yeah. accept. Um, that way then they That's would right. have the excuse to do the push. They would rather not have the deal yeah. with the president they don't like and and wait until they can get their guy in there. And that was that very matter, interesting. I, I, if I it's that, that cynical, that it could be as bad as you're saying, too. They wanted to see the Russians come and take back Crimea just so they can sell more planes for the Latvians or who knows what. Uh, give us a sec. We'll be right back with Sheldon Richmond in a moment, y'all. Hey, y'all, Scott here. Man, I had a chance to have an essay published in the book Why Peace, edited by Mark Gutman, but I didn't understand what an opportunity it was. Boy, do I regret I didn't take it. This compendium of thoughts by the greatest anti-war writers and activists of our generation will be remembered and studied long into the future. You've got to get Why Peace. You've got to read Why Peace. It features articles by Harry Brown, Robert Naiman, Fred Bronfman, Dahlia Wasfi, Richard Cummings, Karen Gutowski, Butler Schaefer, Kathy Kelly, Robert Higgs, Anthony Gregory, and so many more. Why peace? Because war is the health of everything wrong with our society. Get why peace. Down at the bookshop or Amazon.com. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org. All right, y'all. Welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show. And by the way, uh... That Brzezinski piece I was talking about where he's completely flipping out is in the Washington Post. It's called, What is to be done? Putin's aggression in Ukraine needs a response. And here he says, much depends how much depends on how clearly the West conveys to the dictator in the Kremlin a partially comical imitation of Mussolini and a more menacing reminder of Hitler that NATO cannot be passive if war erupts in Europe. Pounding on the damn desk as he wrote this thing, as he dictated his, his, it to his the secretary. Kid, his, his kids, Mika and Ian, got to him. It sounds like it. Sorry to say. Man. You got to stand up to your kids sometimes, uh, Mr. Zvig. And this is the guy who went before the Senate back in 07 and said, You want to have a war with Iran? Let me tell you, you're going to be occupying all the land from Israel to India. Stupid. You can't. Knock this off <laughs> right now. <laughs> and the senators were like, Oh. Oh, I guess we hadn't really thought of that. <laughs> or something, you know, they they really reacted like, "Oh, I, I was instructed that I'm supposed to listen to things that you say, Mr. ZB, and uh you really don't think so, huh?" Okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh t- terrible. All right, so now the everybody on earth is laughing their ass off at John Kerry talking about the sanctity of sovereign borders and how, you know, in the 21st century, yeah. even the 20th you don't just go trumping up excuses to invade other people's countries, Sheldon. No, you don't. You don't. <laughs> uh, has he looked in a mirror lately? Uh, as I understand it, he did, wasn't he for the invasion of, of Iraq? Absolutely. Uh, and you know what's funny about that, too, is he's one of the ones who was opposed to the first Gulf War and never lived it down. It was one of the most embarrassing things of his whole life is that he didn't support yeah. that wanton slaughter and uh, hurt him politically. And so when it came to 2003, there was just no question of which side he was going to err on. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, and many, many people have pointed out, as I say in the article I think you're about to ask me about, uh, <laughs> many level-headed uh, commentators have said that uh, the government, the U.S. government is in no position to lecture Russia about respecting uh, other nations' borders, and uh, it's just ridiculous. I mean, it, it, they think his, they think uh, Americans have no historical memory whatsoever. Now that may be true. Most Americans don't have a historical uh, memory, so they they can get away with that. But some of us do, and we've been writing about it. And so maybe uh, fewer Americans lack that memory than the than it used to be the case. Right. Well, what happens is we learn in government school that anything our government ever did was justified, and the proof of that is that they were elected. So therefore, through the magic of democracy, it's what the people wanted. Everything they did is what the people wanted, and of course, the people wouldn't have wanted it if it wasn't the right thing. And so all of American history is exactly how it had to be. 
couldn't have been any <laughs> other the, way. It was all for the, the best, like pen gloss. That's the, that's the Quig theory, uh, theory of history, right? It's always onward and upward. Yeah, exactly. Any, anything that's left behind deserves to be left behind. So, Well, so uh, give us some revisionism progress. then. Tell us it ain't so. Well, it ain't so. Uh, and a lot of Americans do understand that the, the U.S. has not always been on its best behavior. For example, they may know that uh, they may know about Grenada. They may know about uh, uh, Panama, although those have probably been forgotten. But Iraq, uh, maybe they know, remember. May, they might remember Iraq. It was only uh, way back in 2003. But and some of them may actually know that in 1898, the U.S. attacked Spain in order to grab its uh, its uh, its colonial possessions like Cuba and the Philippines. Uh, and they may think, uh, well, that, and, and, and even in school, you're kind of taught that was an, an act of empire. Uh, so th- that's not totally foreign. If people remember their school years, uh, they, they yeah, may be. Uh, the chapter heading will be the age of empire from yeah, 1892 like an, through 1902. <laughs> <laughs> then, it ended, then it ended. That's right. But I go back even further in this piece, which uh, you can find at FFF.org. It's also on Counterpunch. Uh, and it, it's called uh, em- uh, Empire on Their, on their Minds. And what I point out is that the the, the uh, imperial state of mind goes much further back in American history, not 1898, not 1896 when they started messing around in Hawaii, but 1776. Uh, in other words, the founders of the country had empire on the mind uh, from the very start. And, and, and I think even some of this you learn in school. They, they saw, you know, they wanted to expand, to, to, not only through the whole North American continent, and that, by the way, included Canada and Mexico. They didn't manage to pull that off. But South America as well. Jefferson talks about someday we'll rule South America, and that there will only be one language. The Western Hemisphere will have one language, one set of laws, one form of government. Uh, of course, they wiped out the Indians. They pushed the Indians, killed the Indians, stole their land, uh, engaged in ethnic cleansing and extermination, that was an act of imperialism. Those were nations, the Indian nations. They were known as nations. Mm-hmm. And we, we, uh, they were on land we wanted. I say we, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, uh, on land they wanted. And, and so it was, it was cleared. It had to be cleared. I love the way Anthony act. tells this part of American, uh, Anthony Gregory, of course, uh, tells this part of American history where, you know, the... The Federalists, the Whigs, the Republicans, same thing. They were always the fascist party, basically, of big business on welfare and internal improvement programs and whatever like they call themselves all the time, where the Democrats were really the more Republican party of decentralized, limited power. They were also the slave owners and the very worst of the warmongers were the from the party of Jefferson and Jackson. And so Yeah, no, the, the, no they were actually known as the Republicans back then. I know sometimes called Democratic Republicans, right. but the shorthand was Republicans, not Democrats. Right. Uh, but I meant uh, Republican fact, in the small sen- uh, in the small R sense of just having yeah. actually a Republican form of government rather than a very centralized one. And yet they were yeah. the worst of the of the war mongers when it really came down to it. They were more centralist than the Whigs because they were all about the war power. Whereas the the Whigs, even you know, like the North, threatened to yeah. secede during the well, War of eighteen twelve, right? The the Northern Federalists were not, yeah, not in favor of the War of eighteen twelve. But but earlier, the Federalists, uh, don't forget, uh, in the in the seventeen nineties, uh, pushed the Indian Wars. Uh, that was their doing. And in the seventeen eighties, before the Constitution, uh, there were Indian Wars going on. Uh, General Anthony Wayne became famous by wiping out Indians, uh, and so that clearing the clearing what we now know as the continental United States was an act of empire building. They also had their eyes on Canada and made various attempts. That was one of the objectives of the War of 1812, uh, which Jefferson backed. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was that was Madison's war. Madison has this eloquent statement about war is terrible, right? It's the seed of all bad things. Right. But uh, I don't know if he said that before, during, or after the War of 1812. Um, there was also, the, you know, there's war in Mexico, uh, in, because they wanted to grab as much as Mexico. They, they expected Mexico to, uh, eventually to fall in their hands, either by outright invasion or just by natural, by a natural process. They acquired, of course, uh, thanks to uh, Andrew Jackson, again applauded by uh, John Quincy Adams, who was Secretary of State at the time, uh, Florida, the, te- the, the territory of Florida, which was larger than what we think of as Florida today, it included you know, parts of Georgia, Alabama. Uh, it, was, it was held by the Spanish. Uh, they wanted Cuba. You know, they, they wanted the Western Hemisphere, and they and then they, and then the Monroe Doctrine was issued. It was written by uh, by uh, Quincy Adams uh, under Monroe, which said to Europe, "We'll we'll stay out of Europe, but you stay out of the Western Hemisphere because we re- we will regard any 
further attempts for you to colonize uh, 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 colonizing it as a as a threat to our security, our safety, and our uh, and democracy. They they often invoke security. In other words, the national security state did not begin in 1947. It began in the early days of the republic, uh, because as uh, William Appleman Williams points out in his book uh, uh, Empire is a Way of Life. Uh, when you think you're the chosen people, as the Americans did, right, American exceptionalism, they thought they were exceptional, and in some ways they were. I mean, the, uh, in overthrowing the British, uh, the people were really established, not the rulers, but the people themselves were establishing a, a non-hierarchical, non-aristocratic society. That was a change. That was radical. But in thinking you're exceptional, that can very easily turn to a dark side, right? You have to bring enlightenment now to the world. We're exceptional. We now must bring the new way, the new way of thinking to the world. And if the world doesn't welcome you like the Indians didn't, uh, uh, you know, if the Indians don't want to take on your way of life, well, then they're going to have to be moved out of the way or killed. And so uh, th- th- that's the bad side of exceptional. It's one thing to think, yeah, we have some ideas that are, that are good for a free society uh, mm-hmm. and people should copy us. It's another thing to think we're going to have to impose it on you whether you like it or not because this is the way and we need to make ourselves safe. That right. was the view. They could only make themselves safe if they turned everyone to you know, this way of thinking and, and uh, you know, at the point of a gun or a bayonet if necessary. Yeah, well, you know, we talked about this before, Sheldon, about how hard it can mm-hmm. be for people when they, you know, especially they maybe they're new at libertarianism, and then they start mm-hmm. applying their libertarian principles, going back through history and looking at all these wars, and it really is asking a lot of them, isn't it, to a, a lot of, and, you know, a lot of libertarians come from the right, too. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it's asking a lot of them to say, you know, actually, no, nope, this whole project has been a corrupt project from the beginning. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, they were the guys who ruined the American Revolution, not who, you know, uh, yeah. made it permanent well, through look, their constitution. We're all, we're all grown-ups. We don't need to uh, tell fairy tales. We don't need to shield people from the truth. The leaders of the of the, the country, the new country, the budding country, saw the revolution in large part as a battle between an, a mature empire and a, a nascent empire. George Washington referred to himself as a as a resident of of an infant empire. Empire. That's what they saw in the future. They thought it was inevitable. They thought it was manifest destiny. They thought it was divinely or orient, uh, you know ordained. But even the secular ones believed it, believed that too. And even the ones who were nervous about the methods of empire. And some of them were. Quincy Adams is a possible example. But even so, even the ones nervous about empire knew that it would rest on ha- uncomfortably with liberty. Still wanted ends that could only be achieved through imperial means. That was the fatal flaw. Even the ones that didn't like empire wanted things that could only be achieved by empire. And so logic pushed them in the in the arms of the outright imperialists. Right. And now back to the beginning again, where our frontiers are on Russia's western border over there in Ukraine right now. As uh, Fitzy G puts it in the chat room, quoting Garrett Garrett, there is no security at the top of the world. We've now taken this empire thing so far that we're destroying ourselves with it, setting ourselves up even for the possibility of a real war with a real power that's strong enough to really fight back and win. Yeah, and I like the line by uh, Adam Gopnik who says the worst pretense of empire is that every rattle on the edges is a death knell to the center. Right. Yeah, that was a great quote. Uh, And it's in Sheldon Richmond's new piece, Empire on Their Minds. Brand new out today at FFF.org. Thanks, Sheldon. Thank you, Scott. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. If this nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone, we are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at ScottHorton.org or TheWarState.com. Man, you need some new stickers for the back of your truck. Scott Horton here for LibertyStickers.com. Aren't you sick and tired of everyone else being wrong about everything all the time? Well, now you can tell them all what's right with some stickers from LibertyStickers.com. At LibertyStickers.com, they're against everything, so you know they're good on your issue, too. Whether it's the wars, police, state, gun laws, the left and right of the president, LibertyStickers.com has hundreds of choices so you can find just the right words to express your opposition and contempt for those who would violate your rights. That's LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck.
Don't worry about things you can't control. Isn't that what they always say? But it's about impossible to avoid worrying about what's going on these days. The government has used the war on guns, the war on drugs, and the war on terrorism to tear our Bill of Rights to shreds. But you can fight back. The Tenth Amendment Center has proven it, racking up major victories. For example, when the U.S. government claimed authority in the NDAA to have the military kidnap and detain Americans without trial, the nullifiers got a law passed in California, declaring the state's refusal to ever participate in any such thing. Their latest project is offnow.org nullifying the National Security Agency. They've already gotten model legislation introduced in California, Arizona, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Kansas, meant to limit the power of the NSA to spy on Americans in those states. We'd be fools to wait around for the U.S. Congress or courts to roll back Big Brother. Our best chance is nullification and interposition on the state level. Go to offnow.org, print out that model legislation, and get to work nullifying the NSA. The hero Edward Snowden has risked everything to give us this chance. Let's take it. OffNow.org. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson is a successful former hedge fund manager who provides his subscribers with a very real window into his investments, updating them on every move he makes in the markets. Right now, Mike's anticipating a bear and is dumping all the stocks while the getting is good, investing instead in gold and the commodities. Protect your assets and learn the wise ways of the markets. WallStreetWindow.com. And check out Mike Swanson's great contribution to the history of the rise of the American empire and the war state. Available at scotthorton.org slash Amazon.